Hey witches, Marcel here. We know you're on the edge of your seats waiting for the next installment of our analysis of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, but you'll have to wait. This week, we bring you a mini-sode hot off the presses from our adventures at Nerd Night Edmonton. We're including the audio from Question Period. I've turned up the volume so you can hear the questions. The sound quality is a little shitty, but this way you get to hear us being heckled as well as being taken seriously. final presentation this evening is not entirely about Alan Rickman. Not enough. Not enough. Exactly. Oh, you're on your own. Uh, we're going to invite two of the ladies who are the uh, creators, hosts of the popular Harry Potter podcast, which please, please welcome Hannah and Marcel. Oh yeah, make it happen. Okay, I have to choose. I already had to choose between cue cards and wine and a clicker and a mic. It's very upsetting. <laughs> the important thing to remember if we forget what it is that we're talking about tonight, it is because we are so overcome with grief at the loss of Alan Rickman today, and you are all very lucky that we didn't cancel and make you all just sit in silence for the next 20 minutes to mourn. Well, we publicly wept. <laughs> You're welcome, we're gonna talk to you instead. <laughs> So, hello and welcome to Witch Please, a fortnightly podcast about the Harry Potter world. I'm Marcel Cosman. I'm Hannah McGregor. And you, dear audience, are here being recorded for a live episode. <laughs> you so, are great. Yes, you are. We love you all. I can see your faces and I'm really excited about it. Watch you all react. So Hannah and I started Witch Please about a year ago because we wanted to reread the Harry Potter series and we thought that making a podcast would be a fun and incredibly public way of talking about our thoughts and feelings when it came to the series. We like to have feelings in public. Um, however, in addition to being huge Harry Potter fans, we are also, click click, professional feminist critics. Um, <laughs> Yes. Right? Yeah, round of applause for feminism. Let's go, guys. Mm. Feminism is so hot mm. right now. Thanks, that Beyonce. makes me feel warm. So, what's the deal with feminist literary criticism? So, literary criticism as a scholarly field essentially means that we take texts and we unpack them, right? We take something that people are already reading and enjoying and we just open them up and try to figure out how they tick. With something like Harry Potter, you're opening it up and trying to say, why did this capture the imagination of such a huge public? But as feminist literary critics, we also want to ask, what can this text and its popularity tell us about gender? We're asking a lot of questions about gender in our readings. So when you think about feminist criticism, the typical thought might be, Feminist criticism is really just a bunch of angry women who take something that's popular and cool and then get really angry about it. <laughs> we like to ruin your fun. The thing is that that's not totally untrue. However, <laughs> what I want you to know is that depending on where you are located in the world, this idea of turning your brain off while you enjoy something is not always an option, right? Like the idea of not thinking critically, it's not something that everybody has the luxury of. And oftentimes when you pick something up that is popular and cool, you can't help but think about it critically. Yeah. So let's look at a recent example, a moment when we suddenly became publicly aware that thinking critically about Harry Potter is something we're required to do. So, Recently, the casting of the exciting new Harry Potter play was announced, and the fandom was shocked to discover that the actor who had been cast to play Hermione Granger is a black woman. 
the response from a huge portion of the fandom was super racist shock. I'm not racist, but... Never start a tweet, I'm not racist, but you're gonna say something racist. <laughs> right? So the response was, even though Hermione is never identified explicitly as white in the books, it was clear that a huge number of the readers of Harry Potter had been assuming her whiteness, had been comfortable assuming her whiteness. That tells us something. That tells us that a critical intervention is required, that we have to ask why. Now, your temptation might be to turn to the author for a definitive accounting. Right? You're like, there's a debate within the fandom. Is Hermione black? Let's ask JK Rowling. She'll definitely answer because she lives on Twitter. Um, however, as literary critics, we're actually not particularly interested in what the author has to say. That's not because we don't love Jo. We love her. She's a powerful woman. Um, however, uh, the point of an interesting literary text is not that it's a riddle with a single correct answer. Not and a our Tom riddle. Anyone? Good. Okay. Am I right, witches? You're welcome. <laughs> um, the point is not to, to solve the book and figure out, like, here's the right answer to what this book means. The point is actually the opposite. The point is to unpack it and discover and explore the many possibilities within an interesting text. So for the folks out there who read Harry Potter and heard the news and said that Hermione can't be a black woman because she isn't explicitly described as black in the text, congratulations, you've performed a surface level reading. <laughs> Good job. Yeah. However, what you've also done is fundamentally misunderstood the way that narrative works, okay? So, all right, let's talk about this. Let's talk about how narrative functions. Oh yeah, that's a great idea. Narrative, as we have suggested in the title of our talk today, is a little bit like a prison. That is to say, narrative is a structure that defines a particular space, right? Narrative has walls. Um, it helps a story to stand up. But narrative also limits you. It prevents you from knowing particular things. It keeps you from gaining access to particular kinds of knowledge. Narrative is as much the important structure that holds a story together as it is about the gaps and silences that you as a reader have to learn to find your way through. It's also important to remember that narrative is only one part of how stories function, right? So there are three terms here to be aware of. There's story, which is the actual events, then there's narrative, and narrative is the version of events that we as readers are given in a text. And then there's discourse. And discourse accounts for the difference between those two things, right? And so to understand how these things work together, it's really helpful to have a sense of what kind of narrator you have providing you with information. Mm -hmm. And there are a whole bunch of different kinds of narrators. So we want to ask ourselves with a Harry Potter series, what kind of narrator is Harry? The technical term is an unreliable narrator, right? That means that we cannot trust Harry's version of events. We cannot assume that what he is telling us as the character through whom, through whom the events of the story are being focalized are accurate. We sometimes refer to Harry as a confused narrator, an untrustworthy narrator, or a really stupid narrator, depending on how generous we're feeling towards him. Or how in, much wine we've had. Yeah, that also. <laughs> so you might be saying to yourself, well, the Harry Potter series isn't told from a first person perspective, so how can it be an unreliable narrator? Well, let's look at an example. There we go, okay. So this example comes to us from the third book, a very beloved book, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Uh, this example that we have here, uh, so what's happening here is Harry is encountering Sirius Black. Sirius Black, what we know about him so far is that he is a mass murderer who has escaped from Azkaban, but more importantly, he is the man who betrayed Harry's mother and father to Lord Voldemort and led to their deaths and that weird lightning bolt scar on Harry's head. Uh, sorry, you mean cool. Sorry, I meant cool. Sometimes I say weird, but I mean cool. Yeah, it's easy, easy mistake. So what's happening here on the screen is Sirius is making a comment to Harry about Harry's father 
And the comment that he makes is interpreted as a taunt. It says the taunt about his father rang in Harry's ears. Okay. So here's the thing. Our narrator in this instance is not objective. If our narrator was objective, it would be telling us Harry didn't know that all along Sirius was actually his godfather and loved him like a son. <laughs> That's such, you should rewrite these books. I should, I should rewrite them. <laughs> Harry didn't know this. Harry <laughs> little didn't did know he that. know. Yes, little did he know. And so the thing to keep in mind when you're approaching the Harry Potter novels is that we can only come to understand things when Harry comes to understand them. You could literally fill a book, like uh, maybe a series of books, with things that Harry doesn't understand. And the other thing is that until Harry believes something to be true, we as readers don't know whether or not it's true. And Harry is often wrong. Mm -hmm. In fact, Harry being wrong is one of the driving forces behind many of the stories. So, now that we have figured out that Harry is an unreliable narrator, what does that mean for us? What it means is there's now space for you as a reader to find your way in, right? You know that you're not taking Harry's account of events at face value, and so you find space now in the narrative for yourself as a reader, which is, you know, the exciting thing about reading. So, there's a variety of different ways in which you might do that. At the base level, we've got personal interpretations, a favorite character, um, a belief that maybe a certain character in the series is underserved, and you're like, Neville's doing a lot of cool stuff, and Harry just doesn't know. You don't understand Neville like I do. Um, <laughs> or maybe you self-identify as a Hufflepuff, and so you're sort of imagining what the Hufflepuffs are doing in their own secret adventures. Um, then if you know you take imagination far enough, maybe you're gonna start writing some fan fiction. That's a critical intervention in the text based on the spaces you can find for yourself in the narrative. Take it a little bit further, now you're gonna start to maybe challenge some of the assumptions in the text about the race and gender of the characters, right? Maybe you're going to race bend the narrative and say, Hermione Granger is black. Maybe you're going to queer the narrative and say, obviously Harry and Draco want to bone. The next logical step after that is a feminist critical reading. That's, I've just made an equation that maybe I don't always want to make. Um, I don't know, that was pretty good. But the argument that we're making here is that the kinds of suspicious or resistant readings that we perform as feminist critics aren't at odds with being a fan. They're actually on a continuum. They're actually the same kind of thing. We're sort of just doing what fan fiction writers do, but more so and boringly and in academic journals. <laughs> boringly. Or on podcasts. Yeah. So one of the really cool things about having an unreliable narrator or having a narrator with limited information is that it leaves room for a huge array of interpretations. So here depicted on the screen is Ron Bulldore. It's one of our favorite fan theories and it's the theory that Dumbledore is in fact a time traveling Ronald Weasley. <laughs> The thing to be aware of is that J.K. Rowling has in fact declared this fan theory to be false. <laughs> J.K. doesn't know. <laughs> you don't know my life. You don't know. Fan theories, just like critical interpretation, do not depend on the author's sanctioning, right? So it doesn't matter that J.K. Rowling has said that this is false. What makes a theory, whether it's a fan theory or critical interpretation, believable is the strength of the textual evidence that you have to support it and not whether the author sanctions it as true or not. So why do we call them fan theories and not fan interpretations? It's just because fan interpretation sounds dumb. There's actually yeah. not a joke there. It's just going to take up too many of the characters in your tweets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> fan theory. So here's where we've gotten so far. We have an unreliable narrator. The unreliable narrator opens up gaps in the narrative for us as critical readers, for all of us as critical readers, to enter into the world of the text. The result of that, abundant, exciting, intriguing fan theories. I really, really love the Draco Malfoy is, is a werewolf fan theory. That's a good one. It's a really favorite of mine. We can talk about it after. But wait, we said a bunch of stuff about story and discourse. What does that have to do with narrative perspective, and fan theories. 
Marcel has to answer that question. Is that me? Oh, yep. okay, great. So let's have an example. All right, so the example that we're gonna use is actually from Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, which is not depicted here in the screen. This image is just because it's so awesome. I just thought it was funny, so I put it on a slide. <laughs> Harry is so sad. That is not unrelated to the example that we're gonna use. So the example from Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, the reason why we're talking about it is because, uh, so this is one of the least popular Harry Potter books. And the reason why it's not so popular is because Harry's really angry and he does a lot of shouting. I, normally I would make a joke right now about the length of the book and how it's mostly just Hey Marcel, just why is the fifth book so long? It's not actually any longer than the others, it's just that Harry talks so much in all caps because he's so angry and so it makes it look longer. Do you it's get it? It's a typography it's joke. It's funny, it's a joke. It's a good joke. Okay. You're all welcome. You're Dog all pound. Welcome. Especially so here's, welcome. <laughs> so, here's, <laughs> so here's the thing. Okay. So the critical reading that we came up with when we returned to the fifth book in our podcast was that this actually isn't just a book about an angry teenage boy. This is a story about a teenager who, is ex who has experienced an incredible trauma. I remember what happened to him at the end of the fourth book? He watched one of his friends die in front of his eyes. He also watched the murderer of his parents come up out of a cauldron. A man lost a hand. It's, let's not get it into bad. it. It's it was bad. terrible. It's terrible stuff, okay? So Harry's experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Moreover, he's being gaslighted by the government and the media. If you are not familiar with gaslighting, it's a really great term and it will probably explain an awful lot of your teenage years, if not later on. And it's where the people around you call you a liar and make you disbelieve your own memories and make you think that you're going crazy. That's what gaslighting is. And this is what's happening to Harry all throughout the fifth book. Yeah, gaslighting is a common tactic used against victims of abuse. When people just tell you enough times that you haven't been abused and nothing bad happened to you, eventually you start to believe that might be true. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's the story? So the story is that Harry is being gaslighted by powerful institutions within his community and therefore is being distrusted by the community as a whole. The narrative is that Harry is angry and is shouting. The discourse is that teenage boys lack the language and the support to adequately and properly express their feelings. So what interests us as literary critics is the way that the discourse divides the narrative from the story. It helps us account for the difference between what we think might actually be happening and what the narrator is telling us. So, sometimes this kind of critical reading helps us actually discover new delightful, wonderful, pleasurable. You just wanna just give me that top button? Uh, That's our five sorry. minute sign. <laughs> sorry, we're too sexy. Harassing the audience. Um, so sometimes this kind of reading helps you discover exciting new things about a story that you love. That's not 100% of the time the case. You're still, as a critical reader, going to discover some problems in your object of study, right? So, when push comes to shove, Harry Potter is a series that is being narrated by a male protagonist. That means everything we learn is being represented to us through the gaze of a teenage boy. That is particularly rough if you are interested in female characters because what you are going to learn about these characters is what a 13 or 14 or 15 year old boy cares about in them, right? So what do we know about Mrs. Weasley? She's good at cooking. So good. What do we know about Lily Potter? Well, she died and she donated her eyes to her son before she did so. Such eyes. <laughs> What do we know about Ginny Weasley? Not much until Harry decides around the sixth book that she's hot, and then all of a sudden she shows up. So hot. <laughs> You're welcome. So the access that we gain to the larger world of Harry Potter is always limited by what Harry cares about, and what Harry cares about is limited by aspects of his race, his gender, his class, all the things that inform the way that we see the world, right? So for example, 
What's the actual story of the triumph in the Harry Potter world? It's the story of a community coming together, a variety of people from different walks of life, uniting to fight against the sort of totalitarian force that is Voldemort and the Death Eaters. What's the narrative we get? It's of one single boy who is the chosen one who must go face to face with a villain to defeat him. What's the discourse that accounts for the difference between that story and the narrative? It's that heroism is singular and that it tends to fall to white men to be the heroes of stories, right? So as we're reading this critically, sometimes it's going to please us and delight us as we discover its many layers. Most of the time it pleases us and Most delights us. Um, and sometimes, God, the reality is sometimes you're just going to get mad at things that you love. So angry. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but, and this is the important thing, right? If a work is strongly written, if it's interesting, if it's rich, and if it has many layers, then it will not only hold up to critical analysis, it also accommodates a wide variety of critical analyses, right? You can approach it with fan theories, with critical interpretations, with your feminist fangs, you can tear it apart and it still holds up and it's still interesting and wonderful. If feminist criticism ruins something, it couldn't have been very interesting to begin with. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. I just, I want to point out that this mic is now on. <laughs> the irony of a white male in his mid-30s facilitating the Q&A after that talk. It's acceptable. We've deemed you an acceptable male. Thank you. You'd be the only ones. Uh, <laughs> but um, Who has questions for these ladies? You can literally ask us anything about Harry Potter. You don't have to ask us about how literary criticism works. All those burning questions about... No. Yes, you, right sir. How do you feel about Lavender Brown's casting the movie? Oh my God, so many strong feelings. Strong, strong feelings, right? So there's a huge amount, there are a huge number of non-racially specified students at Hogwarts, right? Some, they go to a great deal of effort to make sure you know exactly what race that student is. Well, this is typically because the book is it presumes a white readership, right? And so when you presume a white readership, you don't need to indicate that your white characters are white. You can just call them characters. You don't have to racialize them. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to introduce characters who are not white, all of a sudden then you have to label them as such. Otherwise, mm -hmm. people get really uppity, such as with Hermione. Yeah. However, with Lavender Brown, we have she's non-racially specified in the book series. And in the early movies, she appears as a young black woman. Um, that's when she is a non-speaking part. The second she becomes a major character in the sixth movie, she's all of a sudden recast as white, right? That's not a coincidence. That's because Western culture is white supremacist and we continue to assume that major characters just sort of possess whiteness as an inherent quality. We can talk about white supremacy after we've had like 14 <laughs> shots, if you want to do that. It's, it goes down a little easier with tequila. The bar might still be open. Uh, 14 shots. Yes. <laughs> Next question. What is this book, Harry You're pronouncing it wrong. It's pronounced Ari O'Potter. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a British thing. How old are you guys? Uh, I'm wow. 12, and she's 11 and a half. Wow. But one day I'm we'll be older grown than you. I'm 12 and a half. I'm oh, stopping sorry. this line of questioning immediately. Brad, you had a question. Can you go into more detail about the, the Malfoy werewolf three? Yeah, oh the Malfoy God, werewolf That's three. a great that question. Okay. So there's the scene towards the beginning of the fifth novel. Is it? No, it's Half Blood Prince, so it's the sixth. So there's the scene towards the beginning of the sixth novel where Harry goes into... Borgen and Burks. Thank you. Marcel has to provide all of the facts. Um, oh, yeah, is that happening? Yeah. Um, and we see 
Harry is watching him through the window, and Harry sees Draco reveal something to the proprietor of the store that scares the proprietor. We assume it is the dark mark. Because that's what Harry tells us that it is. Yeah. But we don't actually know that because we don't see it, and Harry doesn't see it. What Draco says alongside displaying his arm to the proprietor is that his father is good friends with... Fenrir Greyback who is a well-known werewolf who has a propensity for biting young boys. Textually, it's children. Sorry, textually, it's young children. Um, We also know that at the end of the fifth book, uh, Lucius Malfoy has done something to anger Voldemort, right? Because he screwed up at the... Ministry for Magic. And (laughs) this is literally how it works. by dropping the prophecy, right? By letting the prophecy out of his hands. And yet we don't see Voldemort punish Lucius in any particular way. So wouldn't that be a good punishment to let his ally, who is a werewolf, bite Lucius's precious only son? And wouldn't that account for what Lucius showed to the proprietor of Borgen and Burks? Thank you. And <laughs> scared him while also mentioning his affiliation with Voldemort? No, the I, other guy. I, I, sorry, sorry. Stop paying attention. <laughs> she stopped paying attention. <laughs> yeah. Ben, you're a great back. Yeah, Good thanks, job, guys. audience. Yeah. So that's the basis of the theory, and the reason why it's a fun fan theory is because there's tons of textual evidence to support it, and the reason why there's tons of textual evidence to support it is because Harry's a shitty narrator. So he leaves us all of the space to just, like, make up crazy theories. Oh, oh uh, hi. Air traffic A-Dog control oh. up there, yes. That's okay. I'm really interested in what you have to say. We're very interesting. <laughs> what, to what extent do you think that the, uh, the movies, which came out more or less simultaneously with the books, have colored the, the discussion around her, her mind and her race? This is a great question, and it's not just applicable to Hermione. It's applicable to all of the female characters. Um, I mean, whatever. It's applicable to all of the characters, blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> You're totally, you are totally uh, hitting on something though when you uh, comment about Hermione because I think that the, it is my opinion that um, the belovedness of Emma Watson is one of the reasons why people felt very threatened at the idea of a black Hermione, right? When you have a character who you understand and you can visualize in a specific way, so you have Emma Watson who is a very attractive young white woman it becomes very scary to think that what you have envisioned is not actually the case. Now, I really want to emphasize that this is primarily going to happen to you if you are already really secure in your worldview of things, as white people we tend to be. Mm -hmm. So when somebody points out that our interpretation of something is limited, we got a little bit defensive. A little touchy. Um, the other thing to mention is that we do actually have evidence of how the casting of characters started to influence Rowling as she was writing later books. So we do know that that's the case. Um, that's particularly the case with McGonagall, uh-huh. right? Who we don't actually get textual evidence of her age until sometime after the first few movies had come out and Maggie Smith had been cast. Um, And it's also the case with Luna Lovegood, who Mm -hmm. um, Rowling has actually gone on record saying that she wrote subsequent novels after the casting of, what's her name? Hmm? Hmm? Yeah, Ivana Lynch. Thanks, guys. You're great. (laughs) Yeah, so after the casting of Ivana Lynch, Rowling went on record saying that she uh, wrote the rest of the novels with Ivana Lynch's voice in her head. So is people being choked about the casting of a, a black woman as Hermione Granger, the same thing as people losing their minds about the next Ghostbusters movie? Yes. Okay. It's going to be fucking awesome, by the it's way. Gonna it's so going to be so, so good. Excited. Awesome. How can Super anyone... Excited. Okay. <laughs> Let's not. Any other questions? Yes, you, miss. Oh my God, we can talk. Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials is just very, yeah, round of applause for Philip Pullman. 
Oh man. Because if you can make it through all the tragic deaths, which <laughs> let me tell you, I could not. And so if you couldn't, okay. it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Um, but the really exciting thing about Philip Pullman's trilogy is that he was writing it in explicit response to the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe series because he was uncomfortable with the way that sexual maturity on the part of the female characters in C.S. Lewis's novel um, meant that they weren't allowed to be in the fantasy world anymore. Right, that as soon as you start wearing lipstick and stockings, you don't get to hang out with a cool talking lion. Um, and so Philip Pullman was like, "That's am I allowed to swear?" Fuck yes. Okay, uh, Philip Pullman was like, "That's bullshit." I'm gonna write a much better series than that. And he wrote a series in which you could actually like, like go through puberty and still have cool talking animal friends, and that was okay. So I love that trilogy. I also want to give an enormous plug to two graphic novels. I'm, one of them is a comic book series and the other one has been turned into a graphic novel. I'm never entirely sure if I'm using the terminology correctly, but one of them is Noelle Stevenson's Nimona, which is incredible. If you've never read it, it is so awesome. If you have a teenage person in your life, I strongly recommend that you give that collection or that book to them as a gift. And then the other one is Lumberjanes, which is also super cool. Oh, and for the adult person in your life, give them Bitch Planet. Oh my God, Bitch Planet. Sorry. If you want, also, if you, in addition to white supremacy, if you'd like to talk to us about comic books after, we're also, we will also do that. Not unrelated. Uh, on that note, we have time for one more question. Yes, in the back there, yes. Can I be your friend so I can just talk about this stuff with you guys all the time? Yeah. Yes. That's it. Making <laughs> friends. <laughs> Round of applause. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you. Gosh, that was amazing. Thank you, listeners, for tuning in to episode Lambda, a live recording of our talk at Nerd Night Edmonton. Special thanks to Nerd Night hosts Lauren and Adam, and the glorious sound engineer John, who kept our levels the levelest. If you'd like to learn more about Nerd Night Edmonton, visit www.edmonton.nerdnight.com and be advised, night is spelled N-I-T-E. And as always, extra special thanks to the robot of our hearts, Hi, how are you doing? who brought the recording equipment and went home early to relieve the babysitter. Tune in on February 8th for our next installment, which will also mark our one-year anniversary. Until then, later witches. <laughs>